Data privacy is important. That's something that everyone should be aware of, but unfortunately, it's not really the case. In a world of free services from companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and others, the allure of giving up your privacy is completely understandable. Over the last few decades, we've slowly but surely been conditioned to give away control of our data to large tech companies who monetize by harvesting our data, building profiles of who we are, and then selling that to advertisers. If that feels a bit gross, well, it's because it kind of is. Don't leave just yet. There's hope around the corner. However, before we start, let's take a quick trip through the history of the internet because context is important. What we think of as the internet today was originally called ARPANET, an experimental communication project started by a research department of the US military to investigate continued access to communication in the event of a nuclear strike. Over time, this military network expanded, evolved, and ultimately branched off to connect research universities to each other, but was restricted from commercial use. Eventually, the US Congress enacted a few bills, such as the High Performance Computing Act of 1991 from Al Gore, and the Scientific and Advanced Technology Act of 1992, which opened the network for commercial access. And finally, what we think of today is the internet was officially born. Now we had a network, but we needed something to do on the network. In 1990, Tim Berners-Lee designed the first hypertext implementation for this network, which we know of as HTML today, and used it to create the first website. Shortly after, with funding provided from the earlier mentioned Gore Bill, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina created the first widely popular web browser, Mosaic. With a network, a language for content, and a browser to view it, all of the pieces were in place for the World Wide Web. So that's a very abbreviated history of the internet and the World Wide Web. Like I said, it's important to have this context because shortly after, that's when everything went wrong. You see, shortly after the internet was cleared for commercial activity, perhaps unsurprisingly, people began looking for ways to make money. For some startups, like Amazon, the path was pretty clear. List items on your website, sell them online. For others though, such as newspapers, magazines, and companies building digital services, it wasn't quite so simple. Getting people to pay directly for services was a challenge, especially when people were still concerned about giving out payment information online. With few business model ideas left, these companies turned to the one indirect monetization model that already existed offline, ads. This started innocently enough. Taking a cue from the print world, companies started reserving space for ads alongside their content. Over time, the display models evolved, and as advertisers asked for more and more ways to profile and target users, site owners were more than happy to comply. Said Ethan Zuckerman, former employee of Tripod.com and the regretful inventor of the infamous pop-up ad, over the course of five years, we tried dozens of revenue models. At the end of the day, the business model that got us funded was advertising. The model that got us acquired was analyzing users' personal home pages so we could better target ads to them. With this revelation, companies learned that they could make a free product that would help them rapidly get over the friction of users paying for services. Ethan would go on to write an article lamenting all of this and title it The Internet's Original Sin, a fitting name because once this fateful decision was made, there was no way back to how things were. The seduction of rapid user growth combined with massive revenue from advertisements, was too much for startups to ignore. The rest of the 90s and early 2000s would see a flurry of ad startups and acquisitions, and by the early 2010s, companies like Facebook and Google had built billion dollar empires off of the system. Very few people stopped to question what the trade-off might be for all of this, because at the end of the day, they were getting some great services without having to pay any money. Lately though, something interesting has been happening. Partially instigated by events like the 2016 election interference scandals from Cambridge Analytica, some people began to wonder, how did these companies know so much about me? The answer, of course, is that all this time we've been using these services, companies have been building incredibly complex profiles about us in the background and selling targeted access to these profiles to advertisers. Like I said earlier, it's pretty gross. As promised though, there is good news. Through a combination of open source efforts, along with the pace of technology driving costs down, it's now not only possible to run your own private cloud services, it's actually neither too hard or expensive. This is called self-hosting, and it works like so. 
First, you need a server to host your private cloud service. This can be done at home on something like a Raspberry Pi or a spare computer, but another great option is using a virtual private server, or VPS. This is a server that you rent from a company like DigitalOcean, OVH, Hetzner, or a number of others. These servers start very cheap, often only costing a few dollars per month. This will give you access to a computer that you can install an operating system on, attached to a static IP address. Next, you'll install an operating system on it. This is usually done through your VPS dashboard, and you'll likely install a flavor of Linux, though BSD, Windows, and other options are sometimes available. Finally, you need to decide what service you want to put on your VPS. This could be anything from a basic VPN, all the way up to a full cloud office suite like Nextcloud. Really, for almost any commercial service you can think of, there will be an open source, self-hosted alternative. And really, that's all there is to it. Because you control the server, you control what happens with your data. There's no company building a profile about you and selling it, so your private data stays private. Also, by using and supporting open source and open web solutions, you're signaling to the tech world that you won't use commercial services that collect and sell your data. So if you love the idea of cloud-based services, but want to keep your data private, look into using a VPS to build your own private cloud. Thanks for watching Not For Sale, keeping your data private through self-hosting, a SmartyFlix production made exclusively for Tilvids.com. Tilvids is an ad-free edutainment video community. Consider checking out the website at Tilvids.com. If you enjoy, spread the word or consider donating.